Good morning, church. Will you stand with us as we worship together this morning? We're going to have a great time in God's presence. Hallelujah.
this morning we just lift your hands and just say the name of Jesus whatever you might be carrying today whatever burden or worry why don't you just lift it up and give it to Jesus hallelujah Jesus we love you there is no one like you Jesus oh Jesus there is no one like you Jesus Give it all to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Why don't you just give Jesus praise? Oh, Lord, we love you. We're going to have a great Sunday today, and we're so happy that you came to church today. Thank you for joining us online. We have communion Sunday today, and um, if you haven't received your communion element at the door, while we um, just take our seats in this time, we will just reflect on just what Jesus has done for us. Um, won't you just raise your hands while we do this song, and um, our worship team will gladly serve you if you haven't received communion element this morning. In this time, before we partake together, while we sing this song, won't you just reflect on your life? Once again, just thank Jesus for who He is and what He's done for you. But in this time, won't you just, you know, what I love about just being still is to just surrender. And this morning, as we just sing this song, may we all just come to a place and a posture of surrender as we give our lives to Jesus.
me Scars that prove the price you paid Now I stand with you complete With you forever face to face In Luke 22, from a verse 19, I just love it. Jesus here, he takes the bread at the Last Supper, and he says to his disciples, he says, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I said to the worship team this morning, as we were preparing for today's service, and I just said, I thank Jesus that he reminds me of his goodness. Because if I look back over my own life and I remember what God has done, surely he will come through for me today. And in some way or another, what Jesus has done for me in the past gives me the strength and the faith to know that he'll do it today. So for a moment this morning, before we partake, would you just bow your head and just thank the Lord that he has always been there for you, that he is true to his word, that he will never leave you, he will never forsake you. And in this moment, be reminded of what Jesus has done. And may that knowledge today give you the strength and the zeal and the excitement to know and the joy to know that God will come through today. Thank you, Jesus. As we remember what Jesus did on the cross, his body was bruised and broken for our transgressions. Let's partake with a thankful heart, remembering what Jesus did has done for us. The Bible then further in Luke 22 says, in the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Lord, today we thank you that we may take communion together in remembrance of your great sacrifice. Thank you that because of your sacrifice, Jesus, we are redeemed, restored, and renewed. Thank you that we can be a part of this new covenant, be a part of your kingdom as your children. Thank you, Lord, that we, as we partake of the cup of the new covenant, covenant that we know Whatever sin we might have car might carry or might have done is washed by the blood of Jesus. And we stand afresh with new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your cross so that we might have victory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's stand from that posture this morning of thankfulness. Let's just give Jesus praise through the song. Let's worship him with all that is within us. We thank you, Lord.
the one who is worthy. Will you lift your song? Will you lift your praise? All praise to the Lord most high. All praise to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ, my King of heaven, my King forever. You storm the gates of my heart. The veil in between was torn. with an atmosphere of worship. Come on, just lift your voice. Let's just sing. Oh, we give you praise. Oh, the saints and the angels before the throne of God. Come on, let a song of worship just lift up. Oh, 
lift your praise. We love your presence, Jesus. sing songs of praise to you. You inhabit the praise and worship of your people. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here today, that you are with us, among us. We love you, Lord. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come in a mighty way today and that you will just touch the hearts of your people. We love you, Lord. We give you all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody says, Amen and amen. Will you give Jesus praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before you sit down this morning, please just turn around, greet a few people, say, great to see you at church. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. Over to you. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Thank you, Pastor Freddy. I must, I must make sure I don't trip you, hey? Stand here. <laughs> Good morning, good to see you all. Valentine's Day tomorrow. Just thinking as I was pra praising here this morning, we all long for an authentic, biblical, uh, legitimate love. But even if we haven't got that this Valentine, we have a lover of our souls in Jesus Christ. And he loves us all and we can celebrate him tomorrow if we haven't got a, a, a Valentine at this stage. So good morning, just there's to everyone here in person and those online too, good to have you here. If it's your first time, please go ahead to the Connect card um, uh, uh, area on the website and let us know of your visit. And if you're here for the first time at church, good to have you here. Please go to the um, Welcome Center afterwards in the foyer and collect a, a, gift, um, a guest pack. We'd love to know of your visit. Growth Track is, we big at Growth Track at New Life Church. It's a three week um, uh, uh, process. First one, which we start, we do it monthly. We, the first one starts today, actually. It's called Become a Member. It's up in the East Wing after the service at 11. So if, if you haven't booked and you still want, want to join us, you're welcome for an hour uh, afterwards at church this, this morning. Uh, becoming a member step two growth track is discover your design we all made and wired in different ways to serve god birds must fly and fish must swim i hope i got that right but that's that's what we must do and uh, we find out we find out what our design is and we all have a 
kind of a feeling about it, but it's good just to confirm it with these, these tools that we use. And then the following Sunday, the 27th of February, it's join the team. So we take, um, it's a progression and we take your gifting and see where you can best fit in serving at New Life Church. And then next, in March again, we start again with steps one, two, and three. So if you missed it this time, join it next time. But please know you don't have to have joined. If you want to join today at 11 o'clock, you're welcome. Next Sunday, we have Encounter Worship with Freddie and the team. And that's going to be very special. We all love that at New Life Church. We linger longer in the presence of God. And we just have a short word, but we have a longer time of worship. Just come next Sunday, bring your in-laws, bring your outlaws, bring the whole bunch. And let's have a special time with God next Sunday. And just uh, just an announcement for the church is that, you know, as, as a church, we need to be responsible and frugal. And we've decided that we're not going to send SMSs on a Sunday morning anymore because we've kind of set the trend now with COVID, um, uh, hopefully seeing the back of COVID. And uh, we have a nine o'clock service in the morning. So we won't be, SMSs cost a bit of money. So we're not going to be sending a Sunday morning SMS, but we will still send SMSs from time to time. But if you don't get one next Sunday, know you're still loved. And uh, so that's what we, we're doing as far as SMS is concerned. Giving is part of our worship. And the scripture I thought of this morning was 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. So let each one give as he or she purposes in his or her heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves the cheerful giver. Let's give this morning out of our of our resources and gratitude to God for all he's done for us. And I'm going to say a short prayer and then uh, the faithful ushers will receive this morning's offering. Oh, Father, thank you for a salvation that you've given us that is so great. Jesus, thank you for your blood shed for the remission of our sins and your body broken, Lord, for our healing. Lord, we can spend our whole life just in gratitude just for all that you've done. Father, thank you that we can give of our resources to help spread your message. And that, Jesus, we give cheerfully and with a cheerful heart this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to watch the TV news while the offering is received. And then we'll listen to Chris teaching on wisdom in the current series. Thank you. Everyone, whether you're with us online or in person, we hope you experience God's presence in today's service. Before we continue with the service, there are a couple of things that we want you to know. A lot of great things are happening here in New Life. Here are a few ways you can get involved right now. You can also follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or sign up for our newsletter. And to check out all that is going on, you can visit newlifechurch.co.za. We're so excited to share that in-person kids and student ministries are back on site. Be sure to visit our website to find out all we're doing to make sure your kids and students have an amazing and safe time. We still have powerful worship, engaging video lessons and fun games available online for kids birth to seventh grade at newlifechurch.co.za forward slash children. We also have tons of fun opportunities for eighth to 12th graders to connect and grow in their relationship with Jesus. Visit newlifechurch.co.za forward slash students to find out all we have going on. Giving is a part of our worship. If you're on site today and would like to give, you can give at our giving station located in the foyer. And regardless of where you are, you can always give online at newlifechurch.co.za. 
We have so many amazing opportunities for you to grow, connect, and be encouraged. We have weekly prayer devotions, online and in-person connect groups, equipped classes, and so much more. We also want you to know that if you need prayer for any reason right now, we would love to pray for you. If you're on site today, please come out to the front of the auditorium straight after the service, where our prayer team and pastors would love to pray with you. If you are joining us online, please complete the prayer card on our website. We have prayer teams ready and waiting to pray with you. No matter where we gather, online or in person, here or there, we are New Life together. Thanks again for joining us today. Good morning, New Life, and uh, warm, warm welcome to everyone online uh, joining us for the very first time. Uh, looking forward just to see your full faces, just for, from a pastoral perspective, but uh, we're being wise and um, trusting over the next weeks or months uh, that um, things are gonna change really for good, and God is turning everything for good to those who love Him, and are called according to his purpose. And it's just precious for us to recognize that we serve the greatest king in all the universe, and that is Jesus Christ. And just us spending a few moments this morning doing something that Jesus asked us to do over 2,000 years ago, uh, us depending on him, understanding if it wasn't for Jesus and his blood and his, the cross, and his life and the resurrection, there's no ways we could ever find forgiveness and a new life in Jesus. And uh, my prayer is that each one of us would just be so aware of God's precious, powerful spirit, the spirit of God that's residing in you and is resilient and uh, helps us overcome any waves, any challenges, and that he's helping us become a wise people in these days and know what it is to build houses on the rock that can stand. We wanna be wise people, and it's, I believe, partly of having an intimate, worshiping relationship with Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord, and also hearing what He's saying to the church, hearing His words, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing the Word of God. And we need the Word of God. It's our final authority, amen, the Word of God. And so we're gonna to look to the Word of God this morning, uh, in and around our series called Wisdom. And I really believe it's a spirit word for every one of us because I believe it's one of the most pray prayed prayers in all the world. Lord, please guide me, please give me wisdom. And I believe the essence of wisdom is looking to Jesus, who is greater than Solomon, who wrote the book of Proverbs. And it's understanding his ways, his principles, uh, in how we can live wise lives, building houses on the rock that stand. Solomon, interestingly, um, asked the Lord. The Lord said, hey, listen, you can have anything you want, anything you want. And here Solomon said, Lord, please give me wisdom. Give me a discerning heart to govern your people and to discern, to distinguish between right and wrong. And the moment we hear that, we think, wait a minute, King Solomon, you already had the commandments of God. You had the laws of God. Why would you be asking um, for wisdom? Why would you be asking to discern between right and wrong if you have all the laws of God? Uh, what we're seeing in the series is wisdom is more than um, just uh, knowledge, it's more than just moral goodness, but it's understanding what to do in the vast majority of life situations where the moral laws uh, or commandments don't apply. For example, what job you should pursue. Uh, who you should date, who you should marry. And the list goes on and on with the many, many decisions that we've got to face on a daily basis. So we need the wisdom of God, His opinion from His Word, certain principles that apply uh, in a very beautiful world. The world is beautiful. We've got to remember God has created this beautiful world. Creation speaks of His glory, but even though it's created, we also understand it's fallen because of our own sin. Yet Jesus through his cross has come to redeem the world and wisdom has been competent with regards to the realities of life. 
the realities and their divine realities. He who says there is no God, according to Proverbs, says that he says that he's a fool. And uh, so there's foolishness in all of us, but we could understand, if I'm gonna be a wise person, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It begins with a relationship with the Lord and his word and the voice of the Spirit. And today, we're gonna speak about one of, we're gonna be looking at the different themes that Proverbs raises and they're interesting themes and I believe relevant to every one of us. One of, one of the main themes that runs through Proverbs, uh, if you're gonna live a wise life, is that you're now gonna to need to learn how to understand anger and how to handle anger. We're living in a culture of anger uh, in, in many different ways, frustrated. And so what we've gotta do <clears throat> If we're gonna be wise people, gonna to learn to understand anger in ourselves and in others. Listen to what Proverbs 16 verse 32 says. It says, it is better to be slow tempered than famous. It is better to have self-control than to control an army. I think for some of us, we think oh, I'd rather be famous and I'd rather have all the power and control an army, but yeah, the wisest man under Jesus said this, it's better to be uh, so tempered than famous, it's better to have self-control than to control an army. And so what we're gonna look at today in terms of understanding the whole uh, principle or theme of anger, the wisdom to deal with anger is the bad anger, the destructive side of anger, that there's also good anger, <clears throat> it's basic goodness, why it goes wrong in our lives and how we can heal it and transform it. Excuse me, there's a bad anger because uh, it has a dangerous power. There's a side of us that we gotta understand in every one of our lives, sometimes we've exploded. We've said certain things, done certain things, and we thought, oh, I was so foolish there. And so anger, when you look at it, it's like an explosive. It's like a dynamite of the soul. It can disintegrate, pulverize things. And Proverbs talks about some of the things that anger can do to us. The one thing is it can disintegrate your own body. Disintegrate your body. Listen to what Proverbs 14, verse 29 to 30 says. It says, he who is slow to anger, that's a wise person, has great understanding. But he who is quick-tempered exalts folly. A tranquil heart is life to the body. But passion, a different translation talks about wrath, envy, jealousy, anger is rottenness to the bones. And so when we look at even research in the world today, we see that anger is more harmful to your body than other emotions like anxiety and sorrow and other various emotions. And uh, it's even harder on your heart than extreme physical exertion. We don't understand anger can really disintegrate our body and our own health. And they sometimes say that also is one of the reasons, not the only reason, sometimes for heart disease and heart attacks. We're so, so bound up and so stressed out and so angry. And here, the Proverbs is talking about that anger can rotten your bones, disintegrate your body because of anger. So anger is a problem for our own health. Anger also disintegrates community. Proverbs 15, 18, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife. But he who is slow to anger and patient calms disputes. What we gotta realize, whenever you and I lose our tempers, we lose. You never really gain by losing your temper. You lose more than your temper. And so often when we can look in our own lives, sometimes very precious things to us, you can lose your respect, you can lose your own job, you can lose your own family, precious friendships as a result of not controlling our anger. Listen to what Proverbs 11 verse 29 says. The fool who provokes his family to anger and resentment will finally have nothing worthwhile left. And so when you and I get angry, Sometimes we can throw words and they can wound the people that we love. And I can say this, for some of us here, we've even thrown words at our own, ourselves. And they're not the heart of God. And we've got to understand that anger has enormous destructive power. And uh, it can really destroy relationships. And we know this, that you're more likely to express anger in your own home than anywhere else. 
And so we gotta recognize the danger of anger. Another area that the anger disintegrates is also your wisdom. So often when you get so angry, it distorts reality for you and that we don't make wise, intelligent choices. Listen to what Proverbs 14 verse 17, it says, a quick tempered person does foolish things. Proverbs 14, 29, a wise man controls his temper. He knows that anger causes mistakes. Now when you've been really, really, really angry, if someone's really provoked you, you've got really, really upset, and you now you've cooled off, and you kind of think, okay, I just, just blew up in that moment. I said things and did things, and I feel like such a fool. Why is it that you and I feel like a fool when we've really lost it? It's because really we were being foolish, we were being fools. And so when you and I get angry, it distorts our view of ourselves, distorts our view of reality, distorts our view of others, of life, and in the moment we can do things that we actually regret and we make unwise, stupid, destructive choices. So anger has an enormous destructive power and it can dis integrate things, it can break down things that are very precious to us. Now, the Bible will also bring another side to this, so there's the bad anger, and it has dangerous power, but on the other side, there's a good anger, and there's a basic goodness in anger. Listen to what Ephesians 4 verse 26 says. It says, 25, be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. So being angry is actually quite biblical. And I think for some of us, maybe in our different, the way we've grown up, is some uh, family traditions and cultures that might say, listen, it's a positive thing to always express your anger. You're gonna let people know exactly how you feel, no matter how you hurt them and wound them. And then others would say, listen, anger is actually a very negative thing. You don't ever get angry. And whereas Proverbs and the Bible are saying, no, wait a minute, this is a unique approach to a very important subject. In fact, an early Christian preacher, John Chrysostom, spoke in and around the biblical perspective around anger. And I paraphrase, but he said this. He said, he that is angry without cause sins. But he who is not angry when there is cause sins. So when there is cause and you don't get angry, there's a part where Bible, or he's speaking from the biblical balance, sometimes we're sinning when we just don't get angry, angry about anything. So this is the tension that we all face as followers of God. A Christian author, conference speaker, helping people in and learning how to develop confidence and being an authentic communicator and where we work, study, and live and how we can share the gospel in real ways. She talks in and around this, she says, think how we feel when we see someone we love ravaged by unwise actions or relationships. Do we respond with benign tolerance as we might towards strangers? Far from it, anger isn't the opposite of love. Anger isn't the opposite of love, hate is. And the final form of hate is indifference. The more a father loves his son, the more he's angry at the drunkard, the liar, the traitor in the son. If I, a flawed self-centered woman, can feel this much pain and anger over someone's condition, how much more a morally perfect God who made them. And so we're gonna see this from a biblical perspective, true love actually does get angry for just causes. True love does get angry. And so often the reason why we get angry is because something we love is actually being threatened. Something or someone we love is being threatened. And so true anger in its purest form, in its uncorrupted, broken form, is love in motion when something you love is being threatened. And so you're gonna get angry when that happens. And if you look at the things in your life that you get the angriest over, there's a question we're gonna sometimes ask ourselves, what is it 
that you're defending, what is so important to you that you're defending in that moment. Because the answer will show you what your heart loves most. What your heart loves most. It's one of the reasons why the Bible talk about, yes, God is slow to anger and he's compassionate and all those things, but it'll also say that he gets angry. He gets angry at the cancer of sin that tries to destroy the beautiful human race that he has created and loves with all his heart. God so loved the world that he created a plan that Jesus would come to take the sin of the world. And so here God gets angry, he gets angry with sin, loves the sinner, but he gets angry with sin. So true love does get angry. Jesus, perfect love, comes to earth and here we see, even though he's perfect love, he gets angry. We see the different scriptures where it talks about he got angry with the money changes in the temple. He got angry with the self-righteous uh, religious leaders who couldn't understand that Jesus the Savior was there and he was angry at the tomb of Lazarus. And so there are different areas where you see Jesus being angry. He gets angry, but he never sins. Now I think every one of us know what it is to get angry and really sin and feel like we really fool, we're really fools in the moment. Here Jesus can be provoked even to a place where he dies on a cross, but he still doesn't sin. What is this? Talk about a wise person, Jesus, how is it that he can live and handle anger the right way? And I believe that's where we all need God's grace and wisdom in these days, because anger will disintegrate our lives if we let it. So it's a sin to never get angry, and it's a sin to blow up, to have blow up anger. It's a sin to never have no anger. What is the solution? I believe the Lord wants us to all grow in what it is to be slow to anger. In fact, I think it was Thomas Jefferson, uh, one of the late presidents of the United States says, when, he, when you get really, really angry, he says, count to 10. And he says, if you're still angry after counting to 10, he says, count to 100. You might find <laughs> anger could subside, but I think all of us can learn to grow in this. Not blow up anger, no anger, but slow anger. Proverbs 16, 32, another translation says, he who is slow to anger is better than a warrior. And he who controls his temper is greater than one who captures a city. In fact, it was uh, Alexander the Great in a fit of rage struck his uh, general, who happened to be his best friend, and he killed him. And it was in that moment that he cried out, he said, I've conquered the world, but I can't even conquer my own soul. So slow anger is the way, because that's the way God is, that's the way Jesus is. Slow to anger is the mark of a wise person, a wise man, a wise woman. Something about when you see a wise person, it's interesting how they're not hot-tempered, but they're slow to anger. When God meets Moses, and Moses is calling out to God on Mount Sinai, and God begins to reveal part of his attributes and his nature to him. Listen to what Exodus 34, verse five to seven says, and he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness. You know, when I was reading this yesterday and this morning, but yesterday, just these scriptures, and I thought, oh Lord, thank goodness you slow to anger. Thank goodness, Lord, that you are a forgiving God. Thank goodness you're a compassionate, loving God, that you're a faithful God. Lord, help me, help us as a congregation become more like the Lord by His grace. And so here the Bible is quite clear that slow, slow anger is how we've got to learn uh, to become wise. And so there's this unique approach. There's the destructive bad anger. There's the good anger. But why does it go wrong in our lives? We can know all these things, but what is it that actually creates the imbalance for all of us? How can we become more like Jesus? Now, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 28 to 29 says this. It says, be not a witness against your neighbor 
without cause. And do not deceive with your lips. So don't deceive yourself and don't be angry with your neighbor without cause. Do not say, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will pay the man back for what he has done. And so you have this last verse, you're seeing that here, this person is angry with the neighbor. They're really, really angry with the neighbor. It might be for a very minor issue. But verse 28 says, in spite of the fact that you're angry, you don't have just cause for that anger. You're making a mountain over a molehill. You don't really have just cause for it. You're thinking you should be furious and angry when actual fact the cause is disproportionate. Your anger is inappropriate to the cause. Now, where does this apply to us in our lives? Where does it go wrong when we know the destructive side of anger, we know the good side of anger, but we still don't get it right and we all need the wisdom of God, me first. And it says, I love So often, St. Augustine, a great early theologian thinker, said the biggest problem we have in our lives is disordered loves, disordered loves, loves that are out of priority. And because we have disordered love, what that does, our anger's disordered. Because we are prioritizing certain things over and above God ultimately, what happens, that's what creates part of the tension in our own emotions and our own management of our anger. And so disordered love means there are many things in this life that are beautiful and good and precious, like your family, like uh, your friends, like your job, like uh, your purpose, your accomplishments, your mate, all these things, good things. But what happens for many of us, we can turn these good things into ultimate things. We turn these good things into ultimate things. And when you love things that are good, but we look to those things that are good things, but we turn them to ultimate things, we're looking to those things to give us worth, we're looking to those things to make us secure, we're looking to those things to make us significant, which only God can ultimately give, that every one of us really are hungry for God's love and a relation with Him, and it's out of that orderly love, placing Him as the ultimate one. When we don't make Him first and the ultimate one, what happens, we make the other things, maybe our status, our accomplishments, family, friends, etc., which are all important, we make them the ultimate thing, guess what happens? And we look to those things, our emotions get absolutely distorted. So, if you're in a relationship and all of a sudden the person breaks up with you, you're obviously gonna be devastated. You're gonna be heartbroken. You're gonna be sad. But if you break, if that person breaks up with you now, all of a sudden, because you've made that relationship your ultimate thing, not God, your ultimate thing, what happens, you wanna kill the person or kill yourself. All of a sudden, our disordered love has created disordered anger. And here's part of the tension for us. And so our emotions are totally over the top. So disordered love creates disordered anger. So often if you think about our own lives, we can get so upset when somebody cuts us off in traffic. Or we can get so upset when somebody passes an insulting remark, and yes, we can get upset about it, and that's partly human, but we get so angry about that moment in traffic or that, that snub, that, that, that nasty remark, And we get far more angry about that specific moment than some violent injustice that's happening somewhere in the world. Why is it? So there's the cause of that. We should be so angry because true love hates that injustice. But in that moment, someone hurt our pride and our ego and we're so much angrier, so much angrier than some injustice that's taking place. Now, what we gotta realize for our own lives, because you and I can believe in God, and God can be one of our loves. We've got many loves. And so he's not our ultimate love, but he's one of our loves. And if what you're really looking to for your significance and your self-worth and your security, let's say is people's approval, or status, or your reputation, a good reputation, or a love from another person. That's what you're looking to for your worth and significance other than looking to God. Anything gets, that gets between you and that thing, all of a sudden we explode. 
And really what's happening is so often our ego, our own pride, our own selfishness needs to be questioned in those moments. Why am I getting so cross in this thing? What am I really defending? What do I really love most in this? Is it because I just feel uh, that I've been insulted and undermined? And yes, we can get angry with that, but why is it that I'm going over the top in it? And this is where we're gonna begin asking ourselves, okay, part of the problem is a disordered love. It's an imbalance in terms of who is my ultimate priority. Not just say to everyone else and my relationships, my family, my marriage, friends, work, all these things aren't important, but maybe the priorities out of whack and I'm taking things a little too seriously. Now there's some things like we've said, true love gets angry. Now hear this principle, loving anger, loving anger has a goal that seeks to target the evil and not the person. If you're gonna, as a parent, truly love your teenage son or daughter or adult child, and you see them being foolish and wise, you wanna destroy the foolishness in the child, you don't wanna destroy the child. You wanna get to the place where you're targeting the foolishness that's creating so much havoc and pain for them, you wanna deal with that. You, you're angry at the sin, you're angry at the foolishness, you're angry at the foolishness in yourself, but it's in context of a father and his own son or daughter, it's in that moment loving anger targets the evil and not the person. But when our love is disordered, what happens is we target the person and not just the problem. We're now filled with vengeance and uh, we got, it's about payback and now you wanna destroy the individual. There are different levels to our own anger. There's level one where there's certain things on a daily basis that can just irritate us, you know, just bug us. We're all human. You hear something or see something or read something and all of a sudden you just get annoyed by it. Very human. And then there's a second level of anger where it's certain injustices and rejection and abandonment and betrayals and letdowns that have also created so much hurt and anger in us. And those things are hard to forgive. They're hard to let them go. They're things that we have not forgotten. It could have happened years ago, but we cannot forgive them. We cannot forget them. And as a result, what that does is because we can't let those things and totally forgive and release them to the, the Lord and let Him heal that, it feeds level one anger. So all of a sudden, certain things on level one, just daily things, begin to really freak you out and anger you. Maybe you've been hurt in a close relationship with a woman and your man and you, you had a great relationship and all of a sudden she hurt you deeply. What happens out of that if you don't deal with that level two, that, that hurt and that letdown and that rejection, um, you can't forgive it, then all of a sudden now you'll put all women on the same category. Same thing from a woman looking at a man. Now all men are pigs. Ladies, stop laughing so powerfully. <laughs> then there's another level, which sometimes we don't realize, but it's a bedrock, it's the, a low level of actually angry with God. It's a, it, can, it can even lead to self-pity and, and like we, we're upset with God because God, I'm, I'm trying to build my life and my happiness on certain things. I've said, I'll be happy when I've got the perfect family perfect job, perfect situation. And because I'm not getting what I want, I'm now really angry at life and I'm angry with you. And what that does, it just feels level two and feel, feeds level one and before we don't realize it, there's a cycle there and sometimes on level one, we get more upset when we don't have to and I think what we're gonna do is allow the Lord to there to be a healing and a forgiveness that happens deep within your heart. I tell you, true healing and freedom does happen by us having a revelation of total forgiveness. And I understand there's a, a, a balance in the process of healing when people have hurt us. But many of our problems in this world are as a result of us not dealing with anger. Psychological problems, wars, oppression, misery, so often as, as a result of us not dealing with anger. How do we heal it? How do we heal it? Because we all need help in these days. 
I think there's three principles we could share, so many others from the Word of God, but one is that we've just got to admit it. Sometimes being, you know, you can accept that I'm sad, but sometimes it's so hard for us to accept or tell somebody I'm really angry about this. And so it's so easy to deny and hide the anger, but deep within us, we're actually still angry with the person. But hey, we're gonna act like, hey, no, don't worry about it, but I'm still angry. And so we deny it and we won't admit it and we're not in touch with that reality, that part of our emotion. And the Lord's saying, listen, I need you to admit it. I need you to confess it. Don't push it under the carpet because that's what's creating part of the problems and making us make destructive choices. And so we've got to get honest before the Lord. If we want to reconcile, if we want to heal, if we really want to um, walk in freedom and move on and not be controlled by this thing, to be free and nothing to prove. And we can truly love from our heart as God has placed the love of God and shed it in our hearts, put in our hearts, how we can live and love like Jesus. But what happens, there can be a root of bitterness, a root of bitterness that grows over time and time. And it could have just been one offense, one letdown. And we've never properly dealt with that before God. And that root of bitterness just grows and grows. And the root becomes shoots and the shoots become trees. And before you know it, it's forests and everything that was worthwhile to use. Now there's nothing left. I do wanna say this though. Maybe you feel you're here today. You don't know Jesus. You feel, Chris, I've been that person who's given over to bad anger over the years and I've destroyed and I've got no one around me anymore. The Lord wants to give you hope and it's never too late to start again. He's a merciful God, he's a gracious God and he wants to work within you and me and begin to heal us and restore us. So we gotta admit it and then we gotta analyze it. We gotta ask the big questions in life. What is it that I'm truly defending? What is it that's making me so angry? Why do I, when that button's pushed to me, what is it about me? And sometimes you might find it's because of hurt and we've been deeply hurt and we've never dealt with that hurt because hurt causes anger. And often it's been said, hurt people hurt people. And so it goes hurt, anger, revenge. And we just live in that cycle and can't understand why our relationships, it's just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Maybe you're frustrated, your goal's been blocked, nothing seems to work. Maybe it's also the reason why you're getting so angry is because you're allowing people to always walk all over you. You're not knowing how to set some healthy boundaries. And that's maybe the reason why you're getting frustrated. Another reason could be because you're insecure, you, you're feeling threatened in the relationship. It's not necessarily that you're angry, but what's, what's actually a catalyst to the anger is the deep-seated insecurity. So what we do is look at this and we're gonna begin asking yourself, okay, what story am I telling myself? You know, you can put two people in the identical situation. The one has blow up anger, the other one has slow anger. What's the difference? It's the way they interpret the situation. And so often we think, well, that person makes me mad. No, I think for all of us, we gotta understand We've been given the freedom to choose. It's, you can choose to respond. You can choose to react. You can choose to get angry. And I understand, hey, listen, we're all human. We're all growing in this. But what are you telling yourself? What am I telling yourself? Because your anger normally comes from what you believe, not necessarily what's happening to you, but what you believe about what is happening to you. And this is where we're gonna change the narrative for all of us. Listen to what Proverbs 17, 27 says. People who stay calm have real insight. And you think about a wise person, a calm person. I don't think Jesus, when he would walk into the villages that he was ministering, and even though there was criticism and persecution, there was a calmness, a steadiness, a stability about him, and he didn't blow off, or blow, the te blow his temper. There was a steadiness, there was a calmness. He was a person who was at calmness and peace, a tranquil heart, and he had great discernment, great understanding. And so a wise person, the more you understand, the more understanding you'll be of others. And so what we're gonna do is begin analyzing this thing about anger. What is it that's upsetting me? Is it that I'm insecure? Is it that I'm hurt? Is it that I'm frustrated? But more importantly, what is this big thing that's so important to me that I am defending? That I'm willing to thumb people around me so I can, I don't wanna lose that thing. What is that thing? And sometimes when we ask the question and we dig deep, goes into the depths of the soul, 
and we're honest in a lot of the situations, not all, but a lot of the situations, I think we might be humbled and embarrassed and think, you know what, this was my ego, this was my pride. And in that moment, the reason why I just blew up the thing what I was really defending is my reputation. Or I just so want the approval of people when I don't get it, I really get so upset. So if I'm being ignored or disrespected, none of us want to be. And there's an underst- we understand we can get a bit ticked off and upset, but when it gets uncontrollable, we gotta realize, wait a minute, what is the thing that you really love? Is it your reputation? Is it the approval of others? And I believe what we can understand is until God's love hear this, until God's love for you is at least as important as that other thing or that person's love that you and I so crave, then there's no ways you can really get control of your anger. So I've got to understand, God, I've got to put you first. You've got to be my ultimate one. Jesus, you said, seek first the kingdom and your kingdom. Seek first you, Lord, and your kingdom and your righteousness and all these things will be added. Lord, I've got to keep you, Jesus, as my king, my Lord, my savior, my everything. Lord, I'm gonna draw my significance, my self-worth, my security, everything from you. And Lord, when I get that right, you help me deal with all the other loves of my heart. And yes, I can manage my emotions right. Yes, I'm gonna get angry and different things, but I'm gonna start to learn how Jesus operates that loving anger begins to target the evil, the foolishness, and not the person. It's a process for all of us. And third way, and we land on this, is transform it. So I admit it, I analyze it, and I transform it. How do I transform it? Listen to what Proverbs 15 verse one says. A gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. A gentle answer quiets anger. Think about who it quietens first. The moment you and I get angry, What happens, often we start getting louder, and the louder it gets, the more strife develops, and the angrier we get, and often it's our tone, et cetera. But here the scripture's talking about a very powerful principle to quieten anger, is gentleness. Gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. So gentle answer can change the atmosphere. Proverbs 25 says this, if your enemy, if your enemy is hungry, Give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals in his head and the Lord will reward you. Now, when you hear this, this is like over the top self-control. This is beyond self-control. How is it? You want me to redeem my enemies, save my enemies? Give them something that can actually keep them alive like food and water? You want me to give them food and water? Lord, I don't know how to do this. How do you redeem your enemies? How do you, when you wanna pay back, how is it you can honestly save them? Now, I'm asking just for a few moments before we close. I'm a father who deeply loves my children and a husband who deeply loves my wife. I'm an imperfect father and also need the wisdom of God on a daily basis. Anyone that's been a parent for a while, you realize (laughs) that when you have kids, they don't only enlarge your capacity to love, they humble you, they grow your capacity to be more compassionate and understanding, but it's big sacrifice. You sacrifice, you sacrifice. Certain things you'd love to spend your time here and money here and there, hey, you're sacrificing. And then there's a moment where one day you've been giving up everything you know to do and yes, you've made your foolish choices in the journey, et cetera. But one day your child comes to you and says, I hate you. I wish you'd never been my dad or my mom. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. You look and you think, goodness, you know what I've done for you. And in that moment, you know that you're innocent in that situation because you maybe said something they shouldn't be doing or they're showing foolishness in that moment. What do you do in that moment as a wise father, wise mother? Well, you can either just withdraw. Think, hey, you know what? I'm not gonna say anything. I'm gonna walk away. This just hurts too much. They don't even know how I've given so much to them and I can't take the anger. And if you withdraw, withdraw in that moment, and I know there's a balance to what I'm saying, but you're giving them up to their own self-destructive impulses. You can just ignore it. 
well, just be a fool then, carry on doing foolish things. The other side, you can go in and say, okay, you say you hate me, well, I hate you back. <laughs> and now it's dead, get, let's get the guns blazing, and it's guns blazing. You give it to me, I'm gonna give it to you. And what you do in our, when we do in those moments, anger so often can alienate us. By the way, sometimes healthy conflict can lead to more intimacy. Sometimes you're gonna have some of those crucial conversations. But what happens in that moment, dad and son become fools. Because now you're just alienating it and foolishness wins over. What's the best way for us? And there's many principles in and around this, but the third way, the way to save your child, to save that relationship, is to target the issue with grace and truth. To basically be gentle, a gentle answer quiets anger, right? Gentle, gently insisting on truth. Hey, listen, I know you're upset and angry, but I'm just gonna say this. This is the truth and this is how it's gonna be in the home. And so that gentle answer over time begins to actually change the atmosphere. <laughs> As a loving father, a loving mother, you can absorb that anger because you know you just love them so much. Yes, you're disappointed that they're having that moment, but hey, we've all had those moments. But you're not gonna pay them back. You're not gonna go eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Relationship, you wanna keep the relationship, but you also wanna target the issue that's creating foolishness and destruction in the relationship. And so you absorb their disordered rage without paying back so that you can save the child. Think about what God, the perfect, loving, compassionate parent does for you and I. If you're honest, there are times where maybe you've been a little upset with God because you didn't get that promotion, you didn't get that break, you didn't get that opportunity. Lord, I prayed and it didn't happen that way and now I'm upset with you. You're mad at God. And God can sometimes take our anger. But how does He treat us? How does He save the relationship? If you go back 2,000 years ago, we took time this morning around communion. Here, the world, you and I, is part of the world because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We're mad at God. We're persecuting Him, Jesus. We're reviling Him. We're criticizing. We're shouting words at Him, punching Him, torturing Him. What was He doing? What's Jesus doing when we're so angry with Him? He doesn't say, well, I hate you back. Doesn't just ignore us. How does He save our relationship? I mean, He, he did not deserve our anger. Innocent, perfect, sinless Lamb of God. He's taking an anger that we deserve because every one of us have sinned and fallen short and we deserved the judgment of God. But yet Jesus steps into our place because He loves us. And then He says the gentlest word on the cross, in pain, suffering, because He loves us. He says, Father, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Don't even know what they're doing. And sometimes we don't even know what we're doing. Sometimes even the person who's upsetting us, hurting us, doesn't even fully know what they're doing. Don't even understand the impacts of sin and words and things like that. And if you see Jesus handling our disordered anger, absorbing our pain and not paying us back, but what He does is He steps in and He, he targets the sin without hitting the sinner. Loves the sinner but hates the sin. He forgave our sins so we could embrace, He could embrace and redeem us as sinners. He redeems us, He gives us what we need, the blood of Jesus, the life of Jesus, redeems us. Now, when we understand how Jesus treats anger, our anger, and you and I know we've wronged God, and you think how he's treated us, that he's forgiven us and gives that gentle answer and says, Chris, I forgive you. I don't know what you're doing. Yes, sometimes people know what they're doing, but they don't even fully know the full impact of it. We understand Jesus, I've sinned and you've forgiven me so much. I wronged you and Lord, you didn't pay me back. What happens, he responded with gentleness. When someone wrongs me, Jesus, how can I respond with gentleness to that moment? doesn't mean 
that there won't be consequence and all that thing, but Lord, how can I redeem my own enemies? How can I do it the Jesus way? And I tell you this, when we have a revelation of what Jesus has done for us by overlooking our offense and forgiving us, redeeming us so that we wouldn't continue to live unwise lives, and you see that grace and that mercy shown us, when someone wrongs you, you think, Lord, how can I demonstrate that mercy, that forgiveness you've shown me to those around me? This is the kingdom way. It's the kingdom culture. We all need the grace and the power and the wisdom of God in it. That I'm not gonna hate the sinner. I'm not gonna hate the person, but I'm gonna love them, but I'm gonna hate the sin. When we do that, we become redemptive agents in this world today. Redemptive gentleness. Listen to this last scripture. A person's wisdom yields patience. And I think it's what we all need is we need patience and God's growing and helping us in this. It's one's glory to overlook an offense. Jesus overlooked your offense by going to the cross and paying for it. So we didn't have to pay for it, amen? Can we just bow our heads just for a few moments? Lord, help us understand our anger and deal with our anger with wisdom and grace. Jesus, you deal with anger so perfectly, so beautifully. You destroy sin without destroying the sinner. You free us, Lord, to respond to others, Lord, in that grace and forgiveness. Yes, speaking grace and truth, not ignoring injustice, not ignoring truth. But Lord, liberate our hearts from the poison of bitterness. Someone right now, it's like there's roots of bitterness. They've gone into every area of your soul and it's a poison. You need to look to Jesus like I need to look to Jesus for Him to remove the roots out of your soul. For you to see, firstly, the love that God has for you. For you to, and I to see the forgiveness that He gives us. For Him to begin to also heal some of that hurt and you are unjustly hurt. But if you don't let this thing go, it's just gonna continue to hurt everything about you and your future. And it's not worth it. God loves you too much. He says, I wanna liberate you. I wanna set you free today. We're gonna call on Jesus and say, come Jesus, rule in my heart. Lord, I need to release it. Lord, I know that vengeance is mine. You say, Lord, you will repay. Lord, I, I need to hand that thing to you. Lord, I don't want it to poison, disintegrate my life, my community, my own wisdom. Lord, I wanna operate in true loving anger that targets the evil, but not the person. Set me free, Jesus. Help me, Lord, walk in a new level of gentleness. Lord, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Give us grace, Lord Jesus. Jesus, rule and reign and help us be compassionate people, calm people, people that are just and love mercy, love truth, and operate in your grace and your purposes in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. I wanna say new life, I love you. Jesus loves you. And uh, He's with us all the way. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna stand and just sing a thousand hallelujahs. That's what the song's called, amen. A thousand hallelujahs, Freddie. <laughs> a thousand hallelujahs. And prayer teams are gonna be available in the front. And if you wanna know more about Jesus, um, there's a next steps table. And we'd love to help you know what it is to have a loving relationship with Jesus. Grace and peace be multiplied to your hearts, your minds, your homes in Jesus' name. The Lord loves you. Love you, new life. Let's worship.
still have the words to say But this joy is mine With a thousand hallelujahs We magnify your name You alone deserve the glory The honor and the praise Lord Jesus this song is forever yours a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more who else would die for our redemption who's ready coming to church today. Thank you for joining us online. If you want to know more about Jesus today, our next day table is there for you. Have a wonderful Sunday and God bless you.